Welcome. Someone once said that good things are worth waiting for. And while I'm not sure this was worth waiting for, I am sure that it's better late than never. In today's episode, I'll be breaking down the blueprint for the Room of Death. I'll be showing you how it works and what it looks like applied in game. I'll also discuss why some of the things are the way they are and share some of the challenges I faced along the way. Hopefully by the end, you'll be able to take some of the things that I learned and apply it to your own creations. But for now, let's quickly build an example of the room so I can show you what I'm talking about. So, before we have a look at that hot mess over there, let's first head over to the Rush Trishan website and take a look at the blueprint. There's a link in the description down below if you'd like to follow along. A big thanks to the folks over at Rush Trishan for creating and maintaining this awesome tool. If you're new to Rush Trishan, here's a couple of tips. To help with performance, click the gear here and lower the speed to zero. This will freeze time, thus freezing the circuit, making it easier to move and look around. Use left click to select stuff, right click to move the page around, and middle mouse wheel to zoom in and out. To get the whole circuit into frame, click here. If you misclick and move something, Control Z will undo whatever's done. If you click here and log into Steam, you get access to more options that can help with performance. Things like disable wire animation, and you'll be able to save and load your own circuits. Now that we have the basics out of the way, the scenario plays out like this. A player pushes a red button to enter the room. The room detects them, activates, and locks the door behind them. The fireplace, furnaces, and lanterns are ignited. The overhead light turns on while a welcome message plays. Welcome to the room of death. In the background, their telephone turns on and an RF signal is broadcast to let people on the server know someone is in the room. A 10 minute countdown begins. The voting system starts counting votes and people start watching the cameras. If the player turns on their radio, when death is selected, it turns off and a message Your plays. Death was selected. When 10 minutes is over, death lights turn on, another message or music plays, Your death has arrived. and the player dies. When they die, the sprinklers turn on, which turns off the fireplace, furnaces, and lantern. Doors close if they were open and the overhead lights turn off. In the background, the telephone is turned off, the igniters, the voting system, and the speaker system get reset, and the red button can be used again. Now that you're familiar with how the scenario plays out, we can begin to examine what exactly is happening. For this next part, you will need to have more than just a basic understanding of rust electricity. In the description down below, I'll link a couple of videos that I think are really good, really well put together. That way this avoids me having to explain in detail how things like ore switches work or electrical branches work. Now it's my opinion that electrical branches are one of the best ways to divvy up power throughout your circuit. 
Just like in your home at the moment, you either have a modern day breaker panel or an older style fuse box. It's a central spot to distribute power from. In this particular circuit, that's going to be the main power group. These wires are powered blue and have power all the time. So anywhere in this circuit that you see a blue wire, you know it always has active power. I have two more power distribution groups here in the circuit. One being not detected power with red wires. These are active when nobody's in the room. And we also have detected power with the green wires. And these are active when somebody is in the room. When a player presses the red button on the outside, all it does is open the door for them. It's once they get inside and that heartbeat sensor sees them, that's when things really begin to happen. The first thing you'll notice is that the heartbeat sensor sets a memory cell. This causes the memory cell to start sending power out through the green wire. This effectively transfers power from the not detected power grid to the detected power grid. For our red button, this results in power being blocked, so even if the button is pressed again, the door will not open. It was while I was working with these two groups that I discovered circuit delay. I'll briefly cover circuit delay when I cover another group, but suffice to say, if you build this, these electrical branches are required to be wired in this order. If not, things won't work properly. From the player's point of view, the first thing they're going to notice is how the campfire, the furnaces, and the lantern all turn on, as well as hearing an audio message. The circuit groups share power and ignite six furnace, fireplace, and lantern are how this was accomplished. When power was removed from the not detected power grid, the red wires, the blocker allowed power to pass through to ignite those igniters. As for the audio message, it comes from the group three messages. Welcome, Death Selection, and Death Rival. This was an interesting circuit to build. I could have had three speakers always powered and trigger them to play at the right times, but that will use 30 plus power all of the time. Using memory cells, I can transfer the same 18 power between all three speakers, making this much more power efficient. The way it works is power comes in on the green wire, which releases power through the blocker. Power is then transferred through the OR switch and into the first memory cell. It outputs from the inverted output on the memory cell into the first speaker to play its welcome message. The other thing that was turned on in the room was the overhead light. The criteria for this light was when a non-authorized person enters the room, the light switch must be turned on, but still giving the player the ability to turn the light off. When that player dies, the light must be switched off. When an authorized person enters the room, the light must remain off, but have the ability to be turned on and off. You may have noticed the inputs on sides of switches. These were the most confusing things I had to learn. We'll go into much more detail later in the video, but let's just say they don't work the way I expected them to. Before we look at the next group, I'd like to address this mess of wires leading to and through the room. I've done this on purpose to demonstrate exactly how many wires actually go to the room and to easily show you where in the room they go. Now there's a few other things that happen when the player is detected, such as an RF signal being sent to let people on the server know that someone's in the room. The telephone in the room becomes active, so you can speak with your loved one one last time or tell your enemy to go fuck themselves. The speaker in the room receives power so the player can turn their radio on if they wish, and a 10 minute timer begins. This 10 minute timer is crucial because it prevents any death from taking place until the time is up. Before we get into the meat and potatoes of this thing, there's a couple of other simple groups I want to cover real quick. Some of the simpler groups include lights for planters, because sometimes people just want to die relaxing in a garden. The group cameras for people to watch participants is a fun one. These cameras give viewers from all over the island a front row seat. The room was also equipped with a heater to keep the participants warm, unless of course, death by cold was selected. Now we get to the brains of the operation the death voting system. This is how one of three death types were selected. If we break this down into two halves, the right side with the telephones was how people on the server could call in to vote. If they didn't know what they were voting for, they could listen to the answering machine message. When the phone rings, it pulses power and a counter goes up by one. The next call comes in, the process repeats. When a counter reaches a preset number, power will pass through, thus selecting death. The other half uses random switches with an auto reset timer. This is a timer that when it shuts off will automatically start again. When the timer turns on, the random switch has a 50% chance of changing its state. When the random switch turns on, it counts up by one on a counter, and when that counter reaches a preset number, it'll pass power through. 
When a counter passes power through, that is the action of selecting a death. Once a death is selected, we now have to ensure that's the only death that's used to kill the person. The way we accomplish this is with the group called locks and votes and secures death type. This is pretty simple really. We're sending the chosen death's electricity through a blocker and then into an electrical branch. That branch is siphoning off just enough power to block the other two blockers, so that way only one death's power can be used. Electricity moves from here over to the next group called death has been selected, speaker trigger. At this stage, we're gonna siphon off just enough electricity to do two things. First will be to ensure that the radio in the room is turned off. And second, we're gonna let the player know that their death has been selected. When a death is selected, the first memory cell is set, which transfers power through the output into the second memory cell. The second memory cell sends that power through the inverted output to the death selected speaker. Once we have that accomplished, we send the remaining electricity over to this group here. For me, this group accomplishes two things. At this point in the electrical circuit, we've kind of run out of power. So it amplifies power for us using the AND switch. And it saves me power because each death type consumes about 10 rust watts. What would take in excess of 30 rust watts, I'm now able to do with only 19. When the electricity comes in from the selected death, it configures the memory cells to output power down the corresponding path. That electricity is then halted by a blocker at the 10 minute timer. Once the timer finishes counting down, it sends electricity over to the death has arrived speaker trigger. Once here, we again siphon off electricity to do three things. The first thing will be to ensure the radio in the room is quiet. Secondly, we'll transfer the electricity that was used for the igniters over to the death lights, otherwise known as the lasers. The lasers dude. And thirdly, we'll trigger the last speaker to either play a message or music for the player to die to. The only thing left to do now is kill the player. In this example, we're using Death by Tesla. In Mike the Bike's video, I had access to a skins plugin that let me skin the garage doors with workshop skins. On an unmodded server where this is not possible, we won't be using the door controller, so the Tesla coils will get a little bit extra electricity. We also have Death by Fire, which is just opening up some garage doors and setting off some alarms to expose some flame turrets. The last type of death is death by cold. This is a rather unique way to die, and it works because this is built in an arctic biome. We use sprinklers to get the players wet, and we turn off the in-room heater. The colder they get, the faster they die, and the coldest is always at night. Now that we have a dead body in the room, the heartbeat sensor stops detecting. This causes the memory cell to switch outputs, and two things happen simultaneously. Not detected power starts to receive electricity, and detected power starts to lose electricity. It will be important to remember this because it was this circuit delay that caused many hours of frustration. Simply put, circuit delay is the amount of time it takes electricity to pass from component to component. Generally speaking, when a circuit receives electricity, it starts at the first component and works its way through to the last. When a circuit loses electricity, it also starts with the first component and works its way to the last. The more components a circuit has, the longer it takes to fully energize or fully drain. Now, as some of you might have guessed, this becomes a problem when you start having multiple circuits interacting with each other. We can see here that as detected power loses electricity, in the following order, we disable the broadcaster, power off the phone and the radio, the overhead light starts its process of switching off, the 10 minute timer and the death type power supply are disabled, the counting portion of the voting system is deactivated, the speakers lose power, and the front door is unlocked. As the not detected power group starts to receive electricity, in order, the speakers are reset, the voting counters are cleared, the overhead light is switched off, the electricity for the lasers is transferred back to the igniters and blocked until someone else enters the room. Last but not least, the sprinklers are turned on to wash the room and to turn off the fireplace, furnaces, and lantern. You're so smart. Now understanding all of that's happening at the same time, I can show you the two key challenges I faced that kept me up at night. First, we're going to look at the switch, a very simple component until I decided I wanted to use the side inputs. Now, like I said earlier, when a non-authorized person enters the room, the light switch must be switched on. When the player dies, it must be switched off. And when I, as the authorized person, walk into the room, I want the light to remain off, but I want the ability to turn it on. When I started, I thought of the inputs on the sides as toggles, just like on a timer, but they're not toggles, they're inputs. This means that they take electricity in and pass it through the output. What I also didn't realize is that they only accept and recognize one input at a time. 
If power is applied to one input before it is removed from the other, it doesn't work. In other words, you have to remove electricity from one input before it's applied to the other. Once I understood that, it seemed pretty simple, but then I ran into a circuit delay. Most of the time, the switch worked fine, but not every time. That's when I had to come up with a delay or a way to reset the inputs so the switch would recognize and accept a new source of power. Yeah, all of that for an overhead light. The next challenge was resetting the three speakers. It should have been simple. All I need is the memory cells reset. If you don't know, the inputs on the side of a memory cell are prioritized from top to bottom. This means that if there's power going to set, nothing will happen if you apply power to reset. Nothing will also happen if you apply electricity to any of the inputs while the memory cell is unpowered. With these memory cells only having electricity when someone was in the room, I have to have them reset before they power off. Once again, that darn circuit delay comes back to make this difficult. I need the speaker trigger groups to lose power so the reset inputs on the memory cells can register, but the memory cells lose power before the triggers drain. So I use a timer to give the memory cells some juice, allowing this reset to happen. So I think that pretty much covers it. I hope this helps you understand how the blueprint operates, and I hope that it inspires you in your projects. I also hope that you can learn from my challenges and avoid wasting hours of time. Now, I'll be the first to admit that there are some flaws here, and there are better ways to do things, but this is only version one, and there's a version two on the way. Please use the comment section if you have any questions, and I'd love to hear any and all feedback. I am building the Room of Death again this wipe on Chill RP. Come on by and say hello. In the meantime, I need to get away from the computer and get outside. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.